Yesterday, I lived bewildered in illusion. But now I am awake, flawless and serene, beyond the world. From my light, the body and the world arise. So all things are mine, or nothing is. Now I have given up the body and the world and have a special gift. I see the infinite self as a wave seething and foaming is only water. So all creation streaming out of the self is only the self. Consider a piece of cloth, it's only threads. So all creation, when you look closely, is only the self. Like the sugar in the juice of the sugar cane, I am the sweetness in everything I have made. When the self is unknown, the world arises, not when it is known. But you mistake the rope for the snake. When you see the rope, the snake vanishes. My nature is light, nothing but light. When the world arises, I alone am shining. When the world arises in me, it is just an illusion, water shimmering in the sun, a vein of silver in mother of pearl, a serpent in a strand of rope. From me the world streams out, and in me it dissolves, as a bracelet melts into gold, and a pot crumbles into clay, a wave subsides <coughs> into water. I can never die. The whole world may perish, from Brahma to a blade of grass, but I am still here. Shanti, Shanti. he's pointing toward this primal consciousness or awareness. Not that which each one of us is as an individual, but that which collectively animates and gives life to all of us. This is really a declaration, isn't it, of oneness and unity. This is really that precious core that we're, we are in fact, but sometimes we feel separate from it. And really all of our practices and all of our searching is in order to come back face to face with this oneness, this certainty of oneness. And to finally heal once and for all our separation, which is illusion and false. We do this when we simply and fully remember who we are in this moment.
So, there's not really much else for me to say to you, to this group. You all have heard all of this, right? So many times. this enough to know that there's really nothing left to do but to keep persisting until you remember and fully realize who you are. On a personal level, I came to know the truth of this when all of the structures in my life exploded and dissolved. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering about like the big picture. There's so much like fear and destruction and wildfires and flooding and hurricanes and political turmoil and it's like all of the structures are shaking and going to dissolve. And the reading that you just read, the last line was, and I'm still here. And I'm just wondering if, like, I just, I'm wondering if the whole thing has to blow up for a really big expansion of consciousness. Does there have to be destruction for realization? Do you suffer in your own life? Uh huh. Do you need to do that in order to grow? Maybe not anymore, uh, but I did. So, yes, that's right. So, the end of suffering in oneself or in the world isn't about explosion. Right. It's about waking up. But it seems in my life that that wouldn't have happened without the explosion. Well, yes, it can seem that way. Does that make it true? No. If from the moment you arose in this body you were conscious of who you were, would you have needed to suffer? No. Or did you just need to suffer because of this belief system of being separate and then out of that suffering come to realize that you weren't as separate as you thought? You see, suffering is here for a purpose. It's not mindless. So whether it's personal suffering or it's the suffering of the apparent world, mm -hmm. it's here to bring people to awakening. Understand that this is the point of samsara, of life here. So while we have this precious birth, the opportunity that we're given is the opportunity to wake up from suffering. But we always end up seeing that the suffering has the root in separation. That's where its root is. <clears throat> so since the world is an extension of me, of my own light, as he says in this reading, mm -hmm. it makes sense that if we're blocking that light, if that light is clouded, if it's hidden, or if it's veiled by the mind, then it just leads to greater and greater suffering. This is what we see in the world. So just as an aside to that, though, understand that in mm, Vedantic um, cosmology, what we call history, or the history of time maybe, is broken down into what are called yugas. And the yugas are just a way of formulating the way that the earth and all of us as human beings, as beings who are looking for that sense of connection, that sense of unity, that sense of 
reunion with our own inner being. Um, these same energies play out over millennium. And so in Vedanta and Hinduism in Indian culture, they speak of these yugas which are long, long expanses of time. And it's accepted as part of that history that this is not the first time that creation has come into existence, the world has come into existence for the sake of human beings to understand who they are. Samsara does that, it creates the illusion of separation, right? And that the earth and it, all of that is manifests out of that. And that first there is a, um, a, a period of just awakening of the planet, let's say, or awakening of life itself, is maybe a better way to put it. And then in that awakening, part of that awakening is the awakening of consciousness and the embodiment of consciousness as human beings. So in the beginning, um, life is a fully enlightened life, an embodied and enlightened life. This is when it's as close to life itself as it can possibly be. But as the yugas go along, and they last anywhere from a few thousand years to some say 36,000 years, and you have all these different numbers and things, but of course we don't have that history, so it's all speculation. So it's really, it may be real, it may be true that this happens over and over, and it may just be a metaphor for how we wake up, both individually and as a planet. But let's just assume for the sake of this conversation that we're talking about something that actually happens. So what's talked about are four yugas, and first there is just the flowering of life itself in all its forms, then there's human beings come to that. Oh, those beings come, all as awakened beings, in order to reestablish the awakened way of being, the non-separation of existence itself. Slowly over time, that understanding deteriorates, and this can take many, many millennium. This can take hundreds of thousands of years. But in the end, the Kali Yuga comes. And the Kali Yuga is the destruction of all that has been before it. And this leads once again, everything is wiped out, this leads once again to a resting period. And then at the end of that resting period, everything flowers again, life flowers again. And the cycle begins again. And you know, if you look in Indian literature, in Indian uh, cosmology, you can see that there are speculations whether this has happened one time, two times, three times, four times. But anyway, spanning hundreds of thousands of years. Right? So you ask, does it have to happen that way? I can't say. But there is a cosmology that says it does happen that way. Right? The flowering of consciousness into life itself, into human beings, through enlightened human beings, then through the deterioration of that, and eventual destruction of the society, and then arresting happens again. So, in that cosmology, yes, it has to happen again. In Buddhist cosmology, they talk about how everything which is born has a duration, and then must die. And this is why in Buddhist practice we look at the breath, and we look at the beginning of the breath, the middle of the breath, the end of the breath, the gaps between the inhale and the exhale in, in that formulation. We look at the way that things come and go in order not to, to become enamored of them, but to realize that everything which is born is impermanent. Right? It's un ultimately unsatisfactory because it can't sustain itself and it ultimately is empty of any self-ness or inherent self, right? So these are the three principles of Buddhism that one realizes through that particular study or practice. So all of these ancient traditions say that the end of suffering or the end of separation comes when we recognize our inherent unity. So that's where our focus needs to be. Right? Last week I talked a little bit about how it can be useful to focus on the end of things. So this is the end of your breath, right? the end of an experience, the end of a meal, 
the end of some kind of movement and it, it's natural stopping that comes and moving on and how to notice the end of things helps to inform us and of course the ultimate ending is death of the body as far as us humans are concerned and so there are lots of practices in all the traditions especially the eastern traditions about being aware at all times in every moment of every day of your impending death because there's no guarantee that you get the next breath and so if you live from this place, then it's said you fully live. Right? So that's a long way of answering your question. And just to say the truth of the matter is we actually don't know. Does it have to be this way? If it is this way, it has to be this way. The difficulty that we can have if we're watching the news and looking at what's happening in the environment and all of that, not that we shouldn't, it's useful to be informed if we live here, but... <clears throat> the problem with it is, is if we focus on all of that, we tend to be missing what is here now in our lives, and we tend to be missing this moment. So while it's incumbent on us, you know, as we're living, to live consciously and to take care of the earth and to take care of the body, because the body is the foundation of awakening, the body finds itself on earth, so the earth is, a, is the foundation of awakening, you can say, also. So... It, it behooves us to look after what is ours, in, but not for the purpose of saving it or of making it somehow perfect, but rather to realize that we cannot realize the truth in this waking state, in this state of aware consciousness, without protecting the body. If we don't, the body will die. We haven't woken up yet, so we haven't made good use of it. Society will die. We haven't woken up yet. The world will die. We haven't woken up yet. So we haven't made good use of it, right? So we do want to honor the things that we're given in order to awaken to our non-separation or our unity with one. The recognition that all of this is one. And if you look at your own suffering and you look at the suffering that is going on in the world, and I agree with you, is increasing now, apparently, <coughs> what you see is that the cause, the root cause of suffering, the root cause of this destruction, is the separation that's felt by each and every individual self which has not realized its unity with consciousness yet. So I recommend if you're aware of those things and those things are really important to you, wake up. You know, If you want to save the planet, wake up. If you want to save yourself, be sure that you do what's necessary for your body to be able to sustain the necessary inquiry which needs to go on and be sustained at all times until it becomes clear. <laughs> right? The Buddha would say, until you realize Buddha nature and it becomes the only thing you're sure of, you continue to practice. Right? Ramana said, as long as there's a you and a them, continue to practice until there is only self-aware consciousness and there's the recognition and I am that, which is what he's talking about. Okay, I definitely will keep practicing. My next question is about our children. I mean, the ultimate answer is just wake up if you want to help them, right? But watching our children inherit this maelstrom and suffer. It, I get caught in that. Do you know anyone, anyone, who does not suffer? No. Well, well... So why have the expectation that they won't suffer? It's not an expectation that 
he won't suffer. It's, um, just a desire to help him. Then we do come back to the central point of this that we're doing, which is wake up. Mm -hmm. you know, the answer is still the same. Wake up. If you want to help anyone, help yourself. Anything that we do from an unawakened position is bound to have unintended consequences. We have no control over that. So, we slowly, through this practice of inquiry, we begin to understand what is innate wisdom and what is that sense of separation. Right? The more we know about innate wisdom, about who we are in this moment, the more we're able to be presence for whatever rises. whether it be children, or neighbor, or partner, or family, or country, or world. Right? Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is wisdom is always the answer. Mm -hmm. What is the foundation of wisdom? The foundation of wisdom is all of this is the self. Until that is our foundation, right? I mean, I say our because we're still talking from an individual and personal mm -hmm. point of view. Mm -hmm. But it's the individual and the personal which gets wiped out uh -huh. in the understanding yeah. of true wisdom. Right. Right. That, I think, is what's happening, is that I'm, that's, that isn't finished for me, like, I still identify with my body, and... And ha personal. And personal, definitely, and having been a mother, mm. um, and experiencing what it's like to literally have another human being inside my body, mm -hmm. um, there was just a natural lack of separation, lack of perception of separation with this particular individual that's different than every other individual. And so I have, that's still there. That's not. That is still there, but one of the things that you can do, I'm also a parent and I haven't had the inside experience, mm -hmm. but I'm also a parent. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the things that you have to remember when you're talking about these kinds of things and thinking about these things is that every time you're mm, contemplating the possible difficulties, the possible disasters, the possible suffering that someone may come into, understand that you are separating yourself from them. Yeah. Right? So if you really want to understand what it means to be the mother of everyone, or the father of everyone, then understand that you must un uproot that sense of separation in your own mind. You cannot do it for another. You cannot protect another from their suffering. But you can refuse to contribute to their suffering. Mm -hmm. The way you refuse to contribute to their suffering is be determined to wake up in wisdom so that every moment you are holding them as yourself. You see, if you're not spending every moment holding your, the people around you, the loved ones, the ones you feel these kinds of very deep and strong rivers moving for, if you're not holding them with the sense of non-separation or the sense of oneness at all times, you are actually contributing to their suffering. Mm. Because every time you're fretting and worrying and being disturbed, it, everyone is deeply con connected to you. 
and they will feel that. They will feel your fear, your sense of separation. It doesn't matter that they're 5,000 miles away. They will feel that. Okay. So what I was perceiving is a less of separation was actually more of separation. It's that, I don't know if it's less or more, but I can tell you it's the projection of separation. Okay. What we're always doing with inquiry is we're always looking to end our sense of separation within ourselves. And everything that we're seeing in the waking state, in body, mind, and world, is a projection of that sense of separation until we finish it. Then it is all the self. Very simple. It's not difficult. It's not complicated. So we keep working and undermining that sense of separation that we feel, that sense of otherness, mm -hmm. of self and other, right? Mm -hmm. Self with a small s, mm -hmm. personality and other personality. We keep undermining that until we're able to see every single person that we come into contact with throughout the day, whether we know them or we don't know them, whether they are our beloved or they're a stranger. When we see them as the self, and we feel them to be the reflection of myself, if we still have to feel that mm -hmm. sense of minus, you know, until we actually achieve that, we are contributing to separation, contributing to suffering, supporting that mm -hmm. as a way of being. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what the teachings tell us and what the masters have shown to us is that is a false sense of self. That is an illusory sense of self. So they're not saying the world is an illusion. In other words, it doesn't exist, although in a way it doesn't exist, right? It really doesn't. But it appears to exist, so all we can do in that appearance is, is work diligently through all of our experiences to see the self in all and in everything and not to see separation anywhere. And to catch ourselves, that's our practice really of inquiry, is to catch ourselves whenever this sense of separation arises. Worry, concern, time and space. You see all of these things which feel like they bind us to things, um, to the perceptions that everything is going to hell in a handbasket at the moment. See, that's the ultimate sense of separation, is that everything is ultimately to be destroyed. When actually, even from a scientific point of view, we know that things, nothing is destroyed. It's all just energy, right? The universe is a closed system. So this body can be destroyed, but the energy which has brought it together, which is consciousness itself, that is never destroyed. Even this body is destroyed. It's just redistributed around the planet as new elements and new plants and new animals and new oceans and new air. <clears throat> that's all that's happened. The elements have dissolved and gone back into their original state. Consciousness itself is unmoved, right? Which is also this, this reading. Mm -hmm. Life itself, if we say use that term as a synonym for consciousness, life itself is always life itself. And we can just look around us and we can see that it's always just moving, reshaping, reform, reforming. Energy is dissolving into itself and coming back together in new forms. This is what's happening eternally. This is the basis of these cosmologies that say, well, you know, look over the course of, you know, you said, I want to look at the big picture and look what's happening in the world. Well, Hinduism will do you one better. Look at the big picture. Look over 200,000 years, look over millions of years, right? And you see that everything is just changing shape and reforming and rising and falling and enduring for a period of time and then dissolving again. This is the dance of life itself.
that's the dance we want to get in step with. That's my personal experience of being with you. That you hold this very steady connection and just calmly let me know over and over, you're not that either, not that either, not that either. And, and it dissolves while you're holding me as yourself. That's my experience of you. And yet, I can't give you that experience. I can only point the way to that experience for you. And say to you, you aren't any different than I am. If you have that sense of that's what's happening here, just understand it's because that's what's there for you. It is the one self, not the separate selves. And that's the The meaning of satsang, satsang translated, is association with truth. So when we come together in this way, over and over, it's not actually to learn something. We think with the mind, you know, we're going to learn something, understand something, come to some sort of practice or some sort of understanding with the mind. And all of that can happen, but it isn't necessary. What we do is come into the space of this truth and associate with it. And eventually, the mind which, or the heart which feels or experiences separation becomes willing to drop that sense of separation and say, oh, okay, so what's here? If I don't feel separate, what is here? Because what is here is always here. It's not dependent on this body or that body. It's always here. It's eternally here. It's what rises and falls, whether it's over a million years or it's over a moment. It's what's always here. So this is what satsang is about. It's this truth. It's not about sitting with one master or another, though that helps. It does help. <laughs> that association, right? Yes. Yes. This is a core teaching, you know, is to spend time in satsang for the sake of understanding who we are. And it's not understanding with the mind, it's actually understanding by being in the presence of the one who knows. Mm -hmm. And is willing to do battle with your mind. <laughs> So this is good, you know, it's, it's, it is very, very helpful once in a while to have conversations with um, mature people, mature in, al along this way and in this way and in this teaching. It's useful because there's so little veiling, there's so little uh, misunderstanding to penetrate. But it's, I mean, it's also useful just to begin again over and over in the beginning, which is what people who are just coming to the satsang are, are experiencing, you know. So they help remind us that to go back again to the basic tenets of what we're, of what it is we're doing here, if we're doing anything. <laughs> but it's also nice just to be with people who have a more mature foundation. 
even when they, I know that some of you are still saying, I, I don't get this. But there is a different sense of presence in some way. It's always the same, but there is a different sense of presence when there's a mature group of people who've been looking at these questions and asking these questions over a longer period of time. Whether it's here in this satsang or just throughout their lives, you know, you all have been considering these things for a lot longer than some other people who come here. So when there's a small group of you that are here, it's just a beautiful thing where we can pull back the curtain and see what, what's really there. I liken it to one of those air filters that gives a little electrical charge to all the dust that's in the room and makes it drop to the floor. That's what it feels like when I'm in this room, is like mm -hmm. my mind just drops mm -hmm. in a way that it won't mm -hmm. when I'm by myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. No one's ever called me an electrostatic air filter. <laughs> Teachings, do these cycles, the different yugas, does that go on infinitely? Or does at some point in the teachings, does that stop? Or do people wake up from it and that's the end of it? Or does, are individually waking up? Well, all of the teachings have always said that, you know, the preciousness of a human birth, and this is both in Vedanta and Buddhism, the preciousness of a human birth is the fact that it's in a human birth that we have the potential to wake up because we're fully conscious, you know, we have the potential for fully aware living and life, you know, so life creates for us this opportunity to take a body and through the suffering and through the difficulties and so on eventually to work our way back to the recognition that we are aware consciousness because understand that a con that consciousness itself has no awareness of itself consciousness simply is it's that which is the underpinning of all of life of everything right it's in aware moments that we're able to realize that we are consciousness itself so consciousness which is aware of itself this is the purpose this. And so samsara, according to all the teachings, has this possibility within it. Yes, there's a lot of suffering, yes, there's a lot of delusion, yes, there's a lot of illusion, but when we work our way through all of that, when we penetrate through that in the conscious, in the aware state of waking consciousness, then the possibility of realizing who we are, which is consciousness in its purest form, and yet aware and awake, this is possible. Right? So this is the foundation for how consciousness gets to know itself, works itself out, comes to know itself again in the aware state. So it seems that that would be a, the dance of infinite consciousness going on and that that would go on infinitely. And once you're aware of consciousness, you're aware of consciousness, what else is there to be aware of? Then it's just, then you're just watching the movie. But then you're, you're always just watching, watching the movie. Mm -hmm. But you're always aware of, of consciousness um, um, when you become awake. So that means that you just continue lifetime, 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 infinitely being aware of Consciousness? Well, now see, you understand you can't mix up infinite consciousness and you-ness. That's true. Mm -hmm. 
Because what dissolves in infinite consciousness is the sense of you-ness or separateness. Right. Right? This is why it's said on the, in the Buddha's way, in the Noble Eightfold Path, that what happens is at the end of recognition of one's Buddha nature, all births are finished. You see, the same is true in Vedanta, because there is no need for samsara anymore. Understand that the samsara is the fulfilling of the need for consciousness to know itself. So once that happens, the need for samsara is gone. So you could say then that um, that's the end. I mean, so that you could say that um, you know, Buddhism uses the term of emptiness, but you could call emptiness just consciousness. What well, those two sad. terms are, well, uh, uh, you know, the traditions use words in different ways, so you have to understand the meaning. So if we're talking about emptiness in Buddhism, we're not talking about nothingness, we're talking about empty of inherent selfness. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the definition of emptiness in Buddhism. There is no inherent self in this. There's no inherent self in this, right? This, without consciousness, is just, right, elements returning to themselves, just decaying and returning to whatever their original state is, right? As air, earth, wire, fire, water, and so on, right? So this is not, mm, this is emptiness, but in the sense that it is empty of inherent selfness. So what is always dissolving in terms of Vedanta is that sense of you-ness, me-ness, my-ness. When that dissolves, then it's said that there is only the self. When this is done in the waking state, in the life of the master, she then lives out her life according to the whatever the karma of this particular drawing together of elements are. But when she drops her body, or he drops his body, nothing is lost because the recognition of consciousness itself has already occurred. Consciousness as itself. O awareness aware that it is aware is all that's left. And what is lost is that sense of separation or that sense of viewness. And in both traditions, it's always said that this is the end of experience of samsara. There's no more need for it anymore. Consciousness has recognized its own nature. Now there's no need to take another body to continue that journey. Understanding that all the journeys of body through the cycles of reincarnation are always about the recognition that you are the self. You are not the individual bodies. This is the recognition of Buddha nature. It's also the recognition of the self as consciousness itself. And you know, this is one of the most difficult things about spiritual life and spiritual practice is to come fully face to face with this recognition that you cannot wake up. There is a wakeness, but not as long as there is a you. And this is why the end of seeking is always pointed toward. Come to the end of seeking, and, uh, and you will understand, you will see directly <coughs> that the final step is the dissolution of meanness. And, you know, for many people, even those, you know, uh, especially those without a lot of training who have this dissolution of meanness, they will go on for forever in their life saying, I, I want to get back to that state of, of dissolution. I want to know that feeling again. I had this vision or this experience of the self or of God or of the direct knowing, and I'm just spending my whole life getting back there. And what they're not recognizing is that the hindrance to, re to being that which they experienced full-time 
is the recognition that you don't get to go there. <laughs> and as long as you want to go there, you will not return there. You just won't, right? Because it's not you that wakes up, right? It's consciousness which awakens to its own nature. It is possible to encourage this full awakening by reminding yourself that your purpose, your, your goal, whatever, however you phrase that, is to make this your last birth in a physical body. Because this is a, a, a huge motivator, but until you face what that means for you, which is the loss of this sense of me-ness, the recognition that you cannot go there. And so you must be willing to just put you down and face that fear because this is the primal fear. This is the primal fear beyond the fear of death of the body. As human beings, we all know what we fear when we talk about death of the body. We all get a sense of what that feels like. But that's not really the primal fear. The primal fear is the dissolution of me-ness, of you-ness. That is eternal, right? That ends your return to samsara. Are you ready? Can you do this? No more life in samsara for you? No more returning? Many of us say, oh no, I don't mind returning, just make sure I have plenty of money. Or I want to return as an enlightened master. Or I want to be the savior of the world. <laughs> Whatever, you know. This is still the refusal to understand that the loss of meanness is total. <laughs> it means no more body. Now, does it mean that there might not be something afterwards? We can't say from this limited perspective. We can't say, does it, is it the understanding in that pristine state that we are, I am the all of everything? You know, we don't know. We can't know that. But the one thing we can know is that if we want the end of samsara, it means the end of you. <laughs> as you are experienced as a body-mind means the end of the world as you know it. And if you really take up the inquiry and take up this kind of way of being in the world, then you take up, you, you are agreeing that you are ready for the end of the world as you know it. Whatever that entails. But you can entail it means the end of the world as you know it. You know that. That's what it means. And it's when you embrace this understanding, yes, everything must go. <laughs> then you can ask this question, okay, then, if everything must go, and the recognition that everything is gone is what leads to awakening in the waking state, then what is it that I am not willing to give up? Because it's that thing which is preventing it. It's that thing that's preventing you from understanding your nature as consciousness. Are you not willing to give up a person, an idea, a practice, a body, life in the world, reincarnation? What is it that you are absolutely, you're willing to give up everything else but that? Memory? Future? Ask yourself this question. Because you, that one thing which you are unwilling to let go of is the thing which will veil your, your recognition of yourself as consciousness, as being consciousness and bliss. Because even those of us that are, have had a life which has not been easy, has been very difficult, 
and we've said all of our lives, I don't want to be here. <laughs> I'm happy to let this end. If we really look deeply, we see that, no, no, no. There's st there still is something that we're not willing to let go. For some people, they're willing to let go of everything but the idea of enlightenment itself, or awakening itself, or practice itself. It's kind of a paradox in my experience that we have to be willing to say, I don't want another birth. I don't want another physical body. So I'm willing to let everything go. <laughs> but I have to be enlightened first. Because this form of enlightenment is enlightenment as a concept. It's not enlightenment as it is, or awakening as it is, it's enlightenment as a concept. So we can say, yes, I'm going to get rid of everything but enlightenment. But then if you come face to face with death, and you know that your death is imminent, it's going to happen, you know, today, tomorrow, you know, as, as happens for people when they're very sick. <coughs> then there can be this recognition that you cannot hold on any longer to anything. So, okay, I have to forget about everything, even this idea of enlightenment. So I have to let go of all of this. I have to let go of everything. I cannot hold on to any concept anymore. I just want to be present here in this awakened moment. And then suddenly there's this opening up that happens, this recognition of who a person really is through the understanding that the one thing that was holding you up was this belief that you were not enlightened and you had to get there first then you'd be willing to let go of life as you know it. Does that make sense? So this is why we keep saying, yeah, just keep letting that go, letting that go. Anything that's associated with a you, whether it's a you, the body, or it's a you, the idea of, I want to be enlightened, or I want to come back my next life as an enlightened master. <laughs> you, know? you have to be willing to let go in totality. I mean, of all those things that you just listed through, mm -hmm. I don't see anything that I'm not willing to let go of. And yet, there's this momentum of this body mind that just, it feels like I'm the fish and can't, can't see the water because I'm, I'm in it. Mm -hmm. and, and I can't pop out of it because I can't see it from outside or something. I'm like, I definitely don't want to come back as this body. I'm, I have already had to give up my son. I, you know, there's nothing that I can see. Maybe you can see something that I'm hanging on to that I can't see, but I can't see what I'm hanging on to. And yet still there's this momentum of my mind that engages with samsara and watches the news and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, blah, but blah. you just said it. You said <laughs> there's this momentum of my mind. Yeah. If you just said there's momentum of mind, I would say yes. There is momentum of mind. But what's holding you back, if anything, it's the momentum of my mind. Uh -huh. So there's a strong belief that this momentum, which you're observing, is mine. Yeah. In any one moment, I feel like I can let that drop. But the next Be moment, it's back. <laughs> but understand the statement. I can, I can let, let that drop. drop. You see, there's, a, there's such a deep root yeah. in I-ness. There's in an assumption. Meanness, it's like, in minus, that's just assumed, and everything else is coming after that. Okay, so... So we keep coming back to the question, what is aware? Who am I? Right? Because we're undermining that I. That I that predicates every single other thing that follows it from the mind. It's like trying to chop down an oak tree with a butter knife. 
can feel that way, but understand that that's a very limiting thought and that's not a very useful thought. Right? Again, understand that the assumption of I was behind that statement. Mm -hmm. Right? Did you hear it? That's like trying to chop down an oak tree with a butter leg. It, the implication is that's like me trying to chop down an oak tree with a butter knife. there's still this underlying assumption that for me, there is this great effort required. There is this yeah. great suffering that's necessary. Who is that suffering for? Me. <laughs> who, is, who is seeing the oak tree? <laughs> me. Who is trying to chop it down with a butter knife? Me. Yeah. You see? Yeah. That, that unspoken assumption is there and it guides everything, that it, every perception that, that you have. Uh -huh. So you have to keep undermining that. Who has to keep undermining it? Like I undermine it and then it pops right back up. <laughs> yes, but understand that if you use the inquiry in that way, it has the stink of untruth to it. Okay. When you, when you snap right back, who is it? Right? That's not the truth of the situation. It's just not. That is mind which is protecting itself, uh -huh. co-opting the inquiry. Okay. <laughs> yes? The reason I say it's co-opting it is because what wants to happen in the mind now is that conversation wants to become a philosophical conversation. The inquiry, used properly, will go... Well, and who is doing that? Who is doing the inquiry? And will we'll just come right back on itself. And to whom is that thought coming? And who is that I? Uh -huh. You see, it won't go into the philosophical discussion about the oak tree and the butter knife. <clears throat> It'll just keep coming back. You see, it's... So it, in a way, you are just trying to cut down an oak tree with a butter knife, let's say, for symbol. But understand that the butter knife... at the root of the oak tree, eventually it'll bring it down. And that oak tree is I. Hmm. And the butter knife is the inquiry. Ramana put it this way. The inquiry is like a stick you use to stir a fire. If you take a big chunk of wood, if you keep taking big chunks of wood, which is your own thought, and throwing it in the fire, right? <clears throat> the fire is never going to go out. It's just going to keep going. Mm -hmm. right? So as long as you keep hauling around these big chunks of wood and putting them in the fire, nothing changes. Mm -hmm. Because the big chunks of wood are your assumptions mm -hmm. about what your experience is and what your perceptions are. But he said if you take a single stick and you just keep stirring the fire, two things happen. Eventually the fire goes out because you're not adding any more big chunks of assumption to it. And the other thing is that the last thing that goes out is the stick. You just keep stirring the fire with it and it just keeps slowly burning back and eventually it burns up completely. Mm -hmm. There's nothing left. This is the inquiry. Everything else is the big chunks of your own assumption. Mm -hmm. So you just keep stirring this pile of your assumptions with the question, who am I? Am I aware? What is aware? Is this true? You see, these are all forms of the inquiry. Mm -hmm. But understand, they're all predicated on the assumption that there is an I. So we just keep... And he says, become relentless about it. Which has also been my experience. You have to be relentless about it. To be unwilling to believe anything your mind says or your, or your senses tell you about what is true. Mm -hmm. I met you two and a half years ago, and I've I had, you know, lots of opportunities to undermine my assumptions. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> two months ago, I went back to my old life, 
and just huge logs, you know, got thrown in the fire and it became a bonfire. <laughs> yeah, all your previous assumptions are right. Everything, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so yes. now I'm back here and it's calming down again, like yes. in a quiet life, like I can have a chance of the inquiry staying ahead of the assumptions. <laughs> But I just got overwhelmed. overwhelmed. So this is the return to our assumptions when we're being premature about our awakening. Okay. We just keep returning to our assumptions. Yeah, it was it, reflex. Yeah, it is reflex, yeah. It's the momentum of misperception, misconception, and misunderstanding. I didn't even try to counter it. I mean, I, I didn't even, I just I hoped that I could have some awareness that it was happening. But the, I just let the bonfire get huge. Yeah. But you see, the thing is that you were still aware. I was. Right? The misunderstanding is still that in that huge bonfire, there was something happening to me. If the assumption had been there's something appears to be happening. That but it was, isn't happening to anyone. That was in there, though. Like, I, w I refuse to contribute more to the drama. Very good. So that w it almost f seemed like another assumption. Now don't take ownership of that. Okay. The fastest way to understand who you are is don't take ownership of anything. Not of your life, not of your body, not of any of it. Don't take ownership of anything. Nothing is mine. If you take that position, what begins to happen is you begin to undermine all these assumptions. And then eventually it comes to you in a moment of recognition that the only thing that is here is the awareness itself. And that is not me. And every attempt to make that me is to reclaim the assumptions again. Mm -hmm. So you have to begin again. This is the benefit, right, of practice of satsang, is you always have the opportunity to begin again when you fall back into the assumptions. Understand that the master does never say, never does say, this body doesn't have some dharma to work out. <laughs> right? This is what's called parabdha karma, the karma of the body. So as long as we have this body, even after there's this moment of awake recognition, I am not that, I am this, which is consciousness itself, awareness itself. The experience, whatever experience brought the body into being, will need to go on. And so we still see that masters get up, they eat, they shower, they talk with devotees, they do their thing, they walk around the mountain, they do work if they need to do work, they haul rocks when they need to haul rocks, they don't do anything when they have to do They look like ordinary human beings, doing very ordinary things. But their recognition is nothing is happening here. There is only this awareness. The awareness is the screen. Mm -hmm. Everything that appears to be happening is what's happening on the screen. And there's a simultaneous recognition. I am not that. I am that which is aware. So there's not even any need to prevent what's happening from happening. Whether it's a small thing, like having a bellyache and diarrhea, or it's a big thing, like some big conflagration <laughs> appears to be going on, it doesn't matter. It's all happening in this, on the screen of awareness. It doesn't matter whether it's bliss or it's difficulty. There's no interest. It's not happening to anyone. This is how the element of freedom manifests. Freedom from meanness, clinging, <laughs> thinking. It's not the prevention of what the body dharma is. The body dharma is what the body dharma is. 
not only for this body, but for every body. I have always had this pat pattern of keeping myself really busy. Um, and um, just very, very active. And behind that is there's something, some kind of a fear, and I'm not totally even conscious what it is, a fear of being alone or a fear of um, what's going to happen next. or There's something underneath that, and I and I don't know exactly what it is, but I was dancing it out today. I dance things out. And um, I decided that uh, I'm just going to go home and just stay there and be there and be with what comes up. And because um, I, you know, I'm always leaving my house. And I've always been this way. So, but now um, I'm thinking... There's, there's a need there that somehow has to be always active and busy. So, um, would a, a more proper response is, go ahead and be busy. Just watch it, because there's not a me that, that's happening to. Or would it be, I should sit home and see what comes up if I just refuse to follow that instinct. So look at, can you look at that me right now? That yeah. me is here, right? Yes, the me is talking about me. Yes. Yeah. So, what's behind me? Busyness is happening. No, you just said that busyness was happening, and behind that, there's this me. <laughs> well, there's something so, there. There's something that has to be busy in order to avoid okay, something so look, else. Okay, so but look past the busy. But you said if I looked past all, if I looked past all this busyness, I see that there's this me that always has to be busy. Yeah, there, well, there's a discomfort. So look past the discomfort. And it's subtle. But it's what's behind the discomfort. And I don't mean what's the reason for the discomfort. I mean look, th penetrate through the discomfort. It's like be okay with the discomfort and look through it. What do you see? Be okay with the discomfort. Yes. Look through it. I think eventually. No, just look at it right now, not eventually. Oh, look at it right now. Yeah. What's behind the discomfort? Look through it. In other words, I don't want you to try to look around the discomfort or avoid it. I want you to look right at the discomfort and see the identification of meanness with the discomfort and now fall through that. What's there now? Action. You're sitting there in a chair. What kind of Oh, I'm sitting here. <laughs> There's no action. There's no action now. I don't see anything happening out here. What's the action? If you say it's action, what... No, I'm thinking about being home, but you're talking about being here. I'm talking about being here. Uh, so, uh, there's no discomfort at the moment. I'm not uncomfortable right at this moment. There's not. A, there's nothing... There's no discomfort happening at, now, at this moment. So, what, what it does appear to you at this moment? No, you're out here. I want you to be inside, oh, looking inside. inside. What's inside at this moment? Um, wonder. Wonder. There's wonder inside of me. Wonder in the form of? Wondering. Um, wondering, yeah. Wondering. Or, or wonder. There's no wondering. There's wondering, like, I wonder what this is all about. 
wondering. There's wondering inside of me, and that's what prompted the question. And so when you... So when there is this recognition of wondering that leads to this sense of meanness that then has to be kept busy all the time. So if you keep, we're just following this, we're following these thoughts back to their origin. So we just keep following through. So, you, so if you have, following through, if you have an idea such as wondering, fall through that now. What's behind that? Fall through that. I don't know. Tell me how you feel. You're okay with don't know? At this moment, I am. Usually, I'm not. <laughs> Usually, I want to know, I want to know. So if, I, so, if I can guide you back to don't know and you're okay with that? And, and when you're, and normally you're not, then I would say to you, you need to wait here in this not knowing. So yes, if you go back to your house, and you say, I'm not going to do anything, then your, your entry point is going to be not knowing. Yes. Because most of the time when we're overly busy and we keep ourselves engaged all the time, what we're running away from is this sense of not knowing. Yes. And so we, we want to keep ourselves busy in the world, we want to keep ourselves yes. engaged with people because we don't want to face this recognition of not knowing. Yes. Yes. It's true. Not what's going to happen next or what now will I do. So, yes. now what I do now what do I do? Yeah. Right now. Yeah. Don't wait till later. Right now. Uh-huh. Now fall into the not knowing. And 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 just see if there's anything there. I'm not asking you to tell me what's there. I just want you to see. <coughs> if you keep falling back through your thoughts, what happens when you're just when you look at not knowing and there's a sense I don't really like this, and that's what makes me always be out running around and doing all these things. don't like this feeling of not knowing. So just look at not knowing now. Well, right now, it's I feel comfortable because there are people around. And I'm in satsang, so it's okay. So the not knowing feels okay. Safe. Safe, yeah. So what feels not safe about being in not knowing when it's just this body mind. Because I'm alone in not knowing. And what's the issue? What's the problem? Um, I guess it's kind of a loneliness. And what's the problem? What's the problem? I guess I make a problem of it. The difficulty with difficult emotions or difficult states of mind is not that they are difficult. It's that I think they're difficult. 
I make a problem out of them. So loneliness becomes something I have to get rid of rather than something that I can use. Like maybe there's light after that. Like fall through it. Fall through it. Fall back into not knowing and fall through whatever is rising. By fall through, you mean just be with it? Uh, is that what you mean? I actually mean what's behind it. What comes before these ideas, these thoughts, and these emotions that you're expressing with your words and with your mind? What comes before? Awareness. Awareness of all this. Oh, awareness of all this. Awareness of this Is that this what you whole, said? Yes, awareness of this whole scenario that I'm describing. Okay. What's before that? Um, it's just happening. You're still looking at what's moving. <laughs> Look at what doesn't move, because you're if you just keep falling back through the mind and through the concepts, you will get to the place where nothing's moving. I don't know what you mean. Fall through that. I don't know what you mean by fall through that. Go come before. Back, come back from it. Go and before. Kind of be detached and watch it. Is that go it? yes. Go before anything you can tell me about what you're experiencing. So as a matter of like. Go like before as a the witness, words. As a witness. Is that okay. What you mean? Okay. If that's what you wish, yeah. But okay. even witness is a concept. What I'm wanting yeah. you to do is I'm wanting to keep pushing you back before the concept you're using to tell me. Can you go to a place where you, the mind has nothing to say about anything? place where the mind has nothing to say about anything. To where the mind does not need to even tell me about it. So what if you're not busy? You see, right. But, I, yes, but, I but want yes, you I see No, but what, what I want you to notice is that the, that leads you right back to the mind saying it's so uncomfortable it has to grab control of it and send you right back out by saying it doesn't matter if you're busy or not. That's the mind's story. Okay. That's as far as you're, it's willing to go. 
that's why I say, why does it, why does it matter if you do nothing? Because that's the more threatening position for your particular yeah. mind body. Why does it matter? Don't let the mind drive you back out into habit pattern. And then just feel what comes up. Is that what you mean? Just yes. feel whatever yes. it is just, that comes up. Just witness what comes up. Witness it, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? Yeah. That's the definition of doing nothing. Isolating yourself in your house is not the definition of doing nothing. That's the definition of doing nothing. Witnessing what comes up. Unmoved. And unmoving. What's unmoved and unmoving? Exactly. That becomes the logical question. If you're just witnessing, what becomes aware of moving and unmoving. Um, doesn't really answer my question, what should I do? <laughs> witness then. <laughs> Just witness. And by witness, I mean when the mind tells you, I don't like to be here in this not knowing, so therefore I should just go out and do a lot of stuff. Yeah. Just witness. Don't go do a lot of stuff. Don't support the momentum of that habit. Okay. Stuff will still come up for you to do. You'll still run out of food and need to walk down to the okay. co-op and shop. Yeah. Right? But, but don't do that prematurely. Be willing to hang out as the witness of doing nothing. Because this is terrifying for you. Yeah, it is a little. Yeah. More than a little, I think. So just um, witness what comes up. Yeah. And don't act on it. Don't even witness. Don't, I don't even want you to say witness what comes up. Because that... That's a me there. And that sets the predicate that something has to come up. Oh. Yeah. I want you to just be witnessing. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are. Don't be a me doing this. Just witness. Try that. Just be willing to witness and not know. Witness implies that there is not knowing. You're not witnessing for the sake of figuring it out, conceptualizing it, understanding what's happening, making decisions, yes or no, good or bad. Mm. You're just here as the witness. And in that, it might be helpful for you to restrain your activity a little bit. Because if your tendency, your momentum, is for you to just, every time you start to feel a little bit of not knowing, is to run out and, and bury it in doing, mm -hmm. that activity will require some restraining. Some saying, some actual consideration do I really want to go do this? Am I just avoiding? Well, okay, no. He said I can just witness. Whatever's in the environment at that moment, whatever's in the interior environment, just be the witness. And be willing to not know. And if, if what comes up is I feel uncomfortable, I feel lonely, witness and be willing to not know. Don't accept the first thing your mind says about what's happening, because it's wrong, I promise you. It is wrong. It's telling you the story it wants you to believe based on past momentum, so don't believe it. 
witness without knowing. Yeah, try that. Let me know. <laughs> Name her Dirty Poet Bat. Yes. <laughs> trying to rush you all along or anything. I just feel like it's time to do this. <coughs> you know, for all of us, there just becomes a point where, and this is a good example of it, where it's just not possible for us to think our way through it. So we have to come to some foundational place where we, we just say, okay, I'm just going to watch this. Yeah. I'm just going to watch this. I can't think my way through it. The interesting thing is that thinking masks wisdom. And as soon as we just start to witness and say, I don't know, we open up the possibility of wisdom showing itself. In Vipassana, they, we call this insight. In Zen, they say the suchness of what is. You see, all these words are used. What's being talked about is as long as we're using the mind to try to understand something, we will not understand it. It's only through the, through the willingness to recognize what the position of the witness is, which is a natural position, but it terrifies us if we aren't practiced with it, where we just are willing to sit and say, I don't know. It's that not knowing that terrorizes us and terrifies us. I can see myself escaping into meditation. Yeah, that's As why we don't meditate here. Because there's a difference between doing between meditation and, and engaging in inquiry. Those are two completely different things. There's no meditation in inquiry. Uh, as it, it's clear that if there's meditation happening, there is an I which is meditating. And this can become a difficulty also in the process that we're calling witnessing. Is that we can, we can think we're witnessing and not noticing that I am witnessing. Witnessing has a pure form and it has a delu diluted form. And the diluted form is I am witnessing. This is the delusive quality of meditation as well. I am meditating on the breath. I am meditating on emptiness. I am meditating on enlightenment. I am meditating on Tara. I am meditating on the names of God. What do we do when we come in here and sit quietly? Isn't that meditation? It, meditation is dependent on there being a subject and object. So you have to answer that question yourself. The question is, what are you doing when you come in here? Because I never recommend to you that you take up a subject and an object position. Well, I don't know what I'm the inquiry is about sitting with one's own silence and just observing and not grabbing onto any object that comes okay. or not come or not grabbing onto nothingness if that's what comes yeah well that's what i meditate with that's how i meditate okay well you can call that meditation but that's not the classical definition the classical definition of meditation is, is there an object present which is being observed by a, by a subject? So there's a subject-object relationship. Beingness is not a subject-object relationship. It's just an observation. Okay. Maybe not even that. If beingness is pure, it's just beingness, or what we also refer to as awareness itself. Awareness itself is just aware. It doesn't need an object. That's why I ask you, are you aware? Okay. Are you aware? Okay, that's a tricky question again. 
<laughs> Why? Are you aware? Because there's you a either you in know, there, you so e there's a you in there, so no, you're asking no, me a tricky e e question. No, either, either there is awareness present or there is not. Are you aware? Yeah, there's awareness present. Correct. Yes. That's inquiry. Mm -hmm. It's not awareness of something. It's just awareness. It's the recognition awareness is aware. Okay. That's inquiry. The recognition, awareness is aware of breathing, that's meditation. Awareness is aware of the names of God, that's meditation. Awareness which knows it is aware, that is inquiry. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So when you go home, you can go beyond witnessing now. You have the key. The key is just remain aware that you are aware. Not that you are aware. Just remain awareness aware is aware. Oh, just aware of awareness. Don't make awareness into an object. Awareness is aware. Awareness is aware. Okay. And just keep coming back to the recognition awareness is aware. Okay. This undercuts everything. This undercuts I, it yes. undercuts all doing, it undercuts everything. Okay. Start now. Stay there. Awareness is aware. You see now, all the confusion of all of our words that just was going between us for the last 15 or 20 minutes, it's just gone, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's just gone. It just dissolved into nothing. Now awareness is just aware. Mm -hmm. yep. Very good. See, no one ever said dissolving the mind would be easy. They just said it was possible. <laughs> Om Shanti, Shanti. <laughs>